UX Podcast Episode 310. I'm James. And I'm Pat. And this is UX Podcast, balancing business, technology, people and society since May 2011. And with listeners, new and old, all over the world, from Belgium to Uzbekistan. And now, just to give you a little bit of a heads up, there's a little bit of swearing in this episode, including in our introduction. Yeah, I get to swear. Anyway, as a design anthropologist and psychologist... Anakira creates meaningful, relevant, and valuable solutions through understanding people's motivations and expectations. And the key to Anna's work is a people-centric approach to innovation, service design, leadership, and organizational change. Anakira is not only a well-respected design anthropologist and psychologist, but she's also one of the highest rated from Business of Buttons speakers to date, making a huge impact on the audience with her talk fuck design thinking at the 2022 edition of the conference. Anna will also be returning to From Business to Buttons 2023 to give us more truth bombs together with a stellar lineup in Stockholm on May 12. For 10% off the ticket price, you can use the discount code UXPODCAST. What kind of feedback do you get when you challenge thinking? Well, that's a, I think that's a very good question. And it really depends on context. It depends on who is in the room, you know, on a one-on-one level or uh, a group. And um, it also has a lot to do, unfortunately, with power dynamics. So if I challenge and I have no power and uh, I'm in a group with just designers who whose egos are very uh, uh, associated to what they produce. Um, and they tend to be those that are designing for, even though they say they're co-creating, um, then I can't, I don't have much leeway. Um, but when I challenge and, you know, and, and actually in the whole idea around challenging is I have to be able to read the room to challenge. And so how I challenge, I've learned over time is how would I challenge those uh, with the established power is very different than I would in a situation when I'm holding a, you know, in a conference. So I've been in those situations where I find it's a maneuvering and it's, I call it the dance, that a good practitioner has to be a good dancer. You have to be able to move in and back and to the side and around. And what you're doing all the time is negotiating that space and negotiating the relationship because my goal is to build a relationship, not kill the relationship. Yeah. Is, I mean, is, is it connected to as well how how threatened the, the person feels? Like, I mean, if you want to be confrontational then you've got to i suppose you so would you have to threaten them so if, if you've got to hit the you've got to hit the right threat exactly and if if i i say something you know offhand that's threatening that can really take a lot of work to get them back into a trust so um it it, it really depends on context and the biggest challenge is i think working with leadership groups or middle management they tend to be middle management is much harder than leaders even. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's remarkable <laughs> and trying to, uh, to work with them and facilitating change, uh, which is ultimately what I'm constantly in, in the job of doing. It's, a, it's a, a some form of change and um, it requires an enormous amount of humbleness and an enormous amount of patience to figure out how to do it. So really the talk, um, fuck design thinking was a a, a wonderful moment of freedom for me, uh, where I could just speak from my heart and set it in perspective. And, um, I'm watching the audience, just so you know, I'm not doing this blind. It's very improv. So the audience guides me. And when I see they're listening or they're laughing or they're, they get it or, you know, then, then I, I just add more 
I really have to thank the audience for allowing the performance to be as it turned out because they gave me the cues. And if I can't see the audience, I'm, I'm you know, I'm not that great. <laughs> so, so it, it was a, it was a dialogue with the audience that allowed yeah. that to develop and how in the word choices and what was going on. So I, I ha- I'm very grateful for that particular audience. And, you know, that comes once in a while, but it's not every time always that you get such a beautiful audience that um, was curious, allowed the provocation, allowed uh, uh, that and wanted to know more. Now, this is super interesting to me, of course, because it connects with your talk in a way that you are asking of designers to also challenge within their spaces the classic way of doing design work, to not get stuck in thinking that you are someone solving other people's problems, but instead get dirty and down with people you are designing for and design with them and work more towards what you call transdisciplinary thinking, uh, where you actually are asking people to shed their titles, essentially work on the same level, everyone is equal, uh, and you come up with new models and new solutions and things you don't know anything about. So there's a lot of things you're challenging yourself, but you're also challenge, challenging the people around you. It, it is absolutely correct. And it requires an enormous amount of reflection about your own behaviors and uh, the behaviors of others. And why do we react to some and why do we not react to others? And how are we perceived and how do, do we perceive others? And this constant negotiation, this constant is, is really the only way to do this. And of course, there is a, a element of idealism in it. But I've actually been in situations and I can honestly say that every great project I've been on that actually had impact because we say we impact and I've been to all these conferences and see how wonderful it is. And I'm like, really? Uh, (laughs) um, But when it really happens, it happens because we trust each other and it doesn't matter if you have the lawyer in the room or the engineer in the room or the uh, designer in the room or the coder in the room uh, or the anthropologist in the room or the psychologist in the room. It's, it's that we're, listening, actively listening to each other and building upon each other's, you know, our understanding and questioning, did we understand correctly? And when we do that, we suddenly don't even, we, we it, what I see, I get it, it's like an out-of-body experience, is what I see is, is that we've merged. We're no longer a designer, an anthropologist. We're just humans trying desperately to find a good solution that's when the ahas happen. That's when the magic happens. That's when we're suddenly in a new space and bam, we get an, a, a solution that we can go to. It doesn't happen when we're sitting, I know best, I know best. And, and it could be that the designers are completely humble and it's the engineers who are the pain in the, I can't say that. I have to be careful <laughs> what I say. They can be pains, um, but it, it, you know some discipline. If if one discipline owns the power in the room, it's it doesn't work. When you use the phrase transdisciplinary thinking, I mean, how does that differ from just you know collaborating or you know or working in a team? What 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 makes what defines transdisciplinary thinking? Well, uh, that's a really good question too, because I think it's that we can collaborate together. Um, and we do that, and there's teamwork. And uh, but let me let's let's look at teamwork first, and then remind me to talk about collaboration if I drop it, because I can I can go off on different tangents. But when we talk about teamwork, um, you know, the waterfall way of doing things, we would argue that's teamwork. And we the cross disciplinary way, you know, oh, we work with designers. And the handover process in the self, it's something I call passing the monkey. Um, If you think about it, a handshake breaks as soon as you've uh, finished with the handover, there's a break. And that break is is where the danger lies. 
Yeah, like the relay race in athletics when you're kind of, you know, you're handing over the baton. Yes. And so then you go off on your own. And I truly believe, I don't believe in this idea of the genius. I don't believe Thomas Edison found up the electricity, you know, or the light bulb by himself, or uh, Bill Gates found what he found by me. There's been people around and they, they, they maybe articulated it first, uh, but they, great ideas come from us working together, not individually sitting in our room in some dark corner saying, aha, here's the the thing. And even if we did come up with that idea, it gets better, it gets polished because we're in communication and collaboration with others. So that's, you know, if, that's if we take teamwork. So, but teamwork could also be the trans, transdisciplinary approach and where you're sitting together and working together equally. I did a project uh, in 2007 where I took leaders to Soweto, to a ghetto in South Africa, where they had to work with two, each group, had two people from Soweto, and they were told exactly that you have to collaborate, you have to work together um, through every step of a design process. And it was remarkable that all but one group failed. The most important thing is, is the failure happened when they went to the solution stage, because when they went to ideation, um, the leaders were so used to being listened to and heard, they went to the whiteboard and ignored, and they were pushing and elbowing each other to get to the board first and leaving behind the people from Soweto who were in the room, but just left out. And then the one group that succeeded, everyone was always through all the phases, sitting around a table, their body language, they were bent over the table, listening, you know, forcing themselves to listen. And these are people who came from completely different backgrounds, disciplines, cultures, deeply listening and engaging, but the others, no. So they tried, but they were in that, and this is one of the reasons why I can't stand the word empathy. You can fake empathy, but you really can't fake that caring, that, that, that I really want to, to make this better together with others. I think I, I mean, I would definitely be in the danger zone of walking up to a whiteboard because it's like, it's embodied in me almost. It's like, that's how, that's how meetings work. That's how, so we're talking about this. Let me walk up to the whiteboard. So. But man, Pao, just to, just to interrupt Pao and just say, I mean, the thing is as well, you're often paid to be that person exactly. who is expected to mm. go up there to the whiteboard and deliver a you know a solution that you've been called mm. into the room to do that in in other people's eyes possibly which means that i in that situation also would need to step up and challenge the way that we do things together precisely and even challenge the idea that you are some uh, uh wizard uh be <laughs> because you know i get it we've all been there i've been there it feels wonderful when when you're appreciated, right? So when we get that, you know, well, oh my goodness, I'm actually getting paid. So then we, we have a tendency to put even uh, uh, bigger blinders on us and, and uh, you know, go for it. Yeah, yeah, I'm the expert. And if you're paying me this much, I must be really smart. Yeah, and that's the times I failed. That's a wonderful segue into like um, the whole thing about ego, and and um, you know the idea of of well leaving your ego out of the room. Um, so to, to explain a little bit more about why that well connecting on from what you're saying now, why is that such a good idea to leave Pa's ego out of the room when we're having a workshop? Because uh, <laughs> if we actually acknowledge that we're doing it with the trash can outside the room and you put it there. Um, the ego no longer has its power for anyone. And what happens is you can make jokes about it. You can be really annoyed at somebody in the meeting and raise your hand and say, I need to go get my ego. And it takes away the, the burn. You know, when you come back and then you do your rant um, and then you say, okay, now, now I put my ego back. It, 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 it allows the, the expert in, you know, or whatever it is that's happening, the anger, it, it doesn't matter, but people see it in a different way. And then 
when people can call out, oh, you took your ego hat without asking, you know, it, it, it becomes a game. So you're putting in play into it. And I think it makes it a lot of fun. It's like almost like a shared labeling exercise. Now I'm putting the ego label on now and I'm going to use it. And then, yeah. oh, no, no, you've forgotten your ego label. Here's your yeah. ego label. So you, you're, really, you're really surfacing that, um, that, that judgment, I guess. Yeah. And, and it allows us to be more clear on our own behavior. It's also, so it, all of it is, the idea is to facilitate that we all screw up and we, we, every single one, there is none of us, none of us who are perfect all the time and allowing for that, uh, I think relaxes people. And, uh, it's, it's, a uh, I find it really beautiful and it happened because, you know, I've been in there where I've been paid to be uh, uh, cocky and say you guys don't know what you're doing and blah, blah, doesn't work. That no one wants to be told what to do. Nobody. So this idea of the transdisciplinary also allows people together to come in. And what does that do? It self-motivates us. We want to be part of the solution. We want to be part of the responsibility. And when we're given that opportunity, we're more likely to succeed at it. My, uh, just spontaneously, I'm just thinking, well, somebody invited to the meeting. So somebody owns the meeting and somebody owns the result of the meeting. So it, it, it always comes down to someone has the power. Someone can say at the end, so we, this, we arrived at these results, but we're the ones who are going to implement it. Or we, now we'll take it from here. So there's, I mean, even if you're doing the right thing, there's always this danger and risk constantly of somebody just taking over. Which is a segue, actually, now you've segued into my latest work. Because one of my criticisms I barely talk about, but I do mention it in that talk, um, was that um, I have some very, very big concerns with our uh, mapping. Our, they become final deliveries, you know, whether it's the user journey or whether it's uh, a gigamap or some beautiful document of an organization or a thing, you know, in, 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 uh, it's often idealized, but even if it's not, it's like it, it, as soon as it's made, it's in the past because organizations are dynamic, products are dynamic, services are dynamic. <laughs> and what I see is we create relics. And I question if it is, our responsibility when we hand those over and we walk away, if we don't own that, um, are we uh, abetting, you know, aiding and abetting practically criminal behavior? You know, <laughs> it's not, it's, it's not technically criminal behavior, but are we aiding and abetting power dynamics that are actually harming organizations or uh, uh, other things that we really need to understand the consequences of our deliveries. Uh, and we're often in those situations where the final delivery is one of these pretty gigamaps. And I've recently done one where I was just appalled. They would pay a lot of money for that one map to put in the boardroom, but that mapping was to give certain individuals power. And, and we don't talk about those things. So, you know, my, my world in the, uh, my envisioning of the future is with artificial intelligence. It's with creating either, I have two, two kind of variants. One is, could we do it like Mission Impossible where, where after, you know, we, we show them that deliverable, but it only lasts for 30 minutes and then it dissolves, you know, it just <laughs> disappears, you know, burns up. Poof, it's gone. Uh, our mission is complete. Poof, it didn't exist. You know, it, 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 that's one variant. The other variant is what if it was a living organism? What if it was dynamic and changed with the changes that people are trying to make so that they, they interject with something new and you can see the result of that and go, oh, that didn't work. Let's change that. Uh, and, it, you know, is it better or worse than it was? Do we go backwards or do we go forwards? And I think AI is going to be a very important element of this in the future and how we uh, um, create dynamic tools that 
and, and the other part is, is that, you know, our tools, they're magical. So they're, I call it shamanism work where, you know, we, we, we deliver these magical things and nobody else can do it. Um, it's not because we're more intelligent. It's because we own those tools. And what if we created tools that people could use together? <laughs> And we're better at that. And I think we saw a little bit of that with Miro uh, during COVID. We saw a little bit more of that happening, the democracy of a tool, because we had to. And how seeing how organizations, because that was a more fluid, dynamic tool that kept, could be changed. Uh, and, and I think there's something, a big learning in that. So that's the, one of the main areas I've moved further with uh in in uh uh since last year and the other is how do we go slow with a sense of urgency oh interesting oh i'm writing on <laughs> that top as many people are nowadays with ai because we're sort of rushing into it and we shouldn't be rushing but but we have to rush because it's going so fast so what are your conclusions <laughs> my conclusions are that the whole world is going nuts way too fast, and that it is our core responsibility to slow things down. And um, I've been experimenting on this, and I also feel that there's a big difference between design anthropology and design, so I'm writing a lot about that in the Foundations of Design Anthropology, uh, which I'm teaching now. Um, and what I see is, and this is a paradox. So if you take the double diamond from the British Design Council as a model for how to do a project, what I find is that uh, with the, the diverging and converging and the diverging and converging again, what I find is, is that designers put so much structure in it. They plan so much for it that they're not really doing a double diamond. They're almost doing a linear process. And um, yeah, it's kind of just kind of up and it's like small diamonds constantly. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and what an anthropologist does is by training, we don't plan because we care so much about what's called the emic perspective, the other's perspective. So we are hopping into this, you know, out like this. And if anything, we need help to be to come back in. But we go out automatically and we're always in conflict with the designers, I'll give you a very good example, and it's around the interview guide. So they spend two weeks making an interview guide that has constrained them and structured them way too early in the process, whereas designers might need that constraint and construct, I mean, design anthropologists need that constraint and structure later. So uh, where we can merge is by learning to be a little less structured in the beginning, just having conversations instead of closing down uh, the space where the ahas happen, back to what we talked about in the beginning. The great magic happens where we're not expecting it. But at the same time, though, here is, is I guess, a bit of a balance between um, feeling, um, you know, self-esteem, confidence and, and, and feeling like I can get through this particular part of the process because I've I've prepared enough to be confident that I know what I'm doing at the same time as not constraining myself and closing doors. And, and my experience is, is in all that preparing uh, you've actually said it just now, which is my big aha, is all those tools are for us, not for the people. <laughs> and I've been reading so many art articles and we talk about enabling communication with the users. And I'm like, are you kidding me? How arrogant is that to say that you need to have our probes or our generative tools and all of our special little things? And that allows us to communicate, you know, with, you know, it, it, it's like saying that these people can't communicate on their own. And what if we did it the other way around? What if we created those tools together with the people we're trying to understand? And I think that just understanding that we think we sit in this expert hat thinking that we know best, when in fact we're closing doors to the beauty of the process. And I love the double diamond. So I use the double diamond all the time. 
So, but I use it differently. And it's where in the process do you use a interview guide? Where in the process do you use uh, probes? Where in the process, who makes those tools? Are we asking ourselves enough who's doing what and why? I have to say, when I've been looking at AI now and, and seeing all these people share on LinkedIn how they're using ChatGPT to uh, generate analysis of interviews uh, and uh, even making interview guides for them or let's make a make a persona for me you're you're it's the same tools so it's, it's so you're not even you're not even this fantastic ai tool you you're not even able to imagine that we can do something completely different but again it's like you're stuck in this mindset of we're building a website for someone why would someone want a website if they can just ask the tool to download the document for them? You exactly. don't need the website anymore. Why are you even building the interface? Exactly. So it's just, we're, we're not thinking about the people at the other end. We're thinking about making our own tools more efficient. Exactly. Yeah. Because you're getting paid to use them, Pash. Yeah. You know, where, where would your research um, practice go if you suddenly didn't need the research practice anymore? Oh my goodness gracious. And uh, I, I have also been thinking that uh, there's been some discussion, you know, at the university, oh, what are we going to do with this? Uh, they can make their personas online, you know, with the, uh, and I've looked at it and I'm like, you know, first of all, I don't like personas, but uh, I like real people. But if they're going to make a persona, I would trust the machine a hell of a lot more than I would trust a student. <laughs> So, so what's the problem? <laughs> oh God, we've, we've just said it's a step forward now. This is this is getting worrying. Yeah, why are we making a problem with this? You want to use a persona? Go for it. Let them mm. make the. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because you're all you've already discarded sort of the tool anyway. But I mean, listening to your talk, it, it's it's about this. If you try and evaluate what you're learning, you need to do that in conversation with others. The sad thing I'm seeing is that people are having conversations with something that isn't human and trying to find insights, but the insights aren't happening there. It's because we're again trying to hide and make something more efficient and feel safe because I can sit in front of my computer and feel safe here and I don't have to interact with other people and challenge my own thinking. And that brings, you know, I had some students, this is a number of years ago, who made uh, a future scenario. So they made uh, uh, products for a future scenario when we no longer talk together, touch each other. What happens? How do we get people human again? How do we get them to speak together and look each other in the eyes and smile? The things that touch each other. We need these things. I had a very powerful, so my research in the next few years is going to be about this. I had a very powerful experience at a conference where the conference owners were very upset with me about a workshop I had because I wasn't giving them a structure. You know, I wasn't giving them the, and I was saying, there's no structure here. I'm, I'm you know, and, and, and we were looking into to this idea of going slow in the sense of urgency. And the more they got their knickers in a twist, the more I was sure I was on the right track. And it was bizarre. And then when I came to this conference, there was a huge room of people. And um, I used most of the time to just ask the, each person one question, which was, what do you want to get out of this workshop? And they, you know, they would tell who they were, what they wanted to get out of it. And I mirrored it back. I used the time. Let me make sure I understand correctly. Is this what you want? And I did this around the room. It took an hour and a half of a two-hour <laughs> workshop. What happened was, you know, you can imagine what people were thinking. Oh, was it enough time for me to say? You know, oh, she said the same thing as me. Well, that's not fair. Uh, oh, this is, you know, is this going to be meaningful? <laughs> and so you, you see the stress in the room. Do we read the room enough? And at the end, everybody was in love. They were in love with each other. They were, they, we were now together. And this goes back to rapport building of you got a project, you just got a hundred thousand uh, dollars to do a project. You damn well better be spending time getting people 
together and spending that time because it's so worth it. And it will so help you on the results later on in the process. So I was able to model basically what I do. And all sorts of, you can imagine in business meetings where people are tapping, is this an efficient way to use your money? Da, 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 da. Yes. In the power of that, we had people crying at the end of joy. And you tell me that we don't need it. I was, I was actually reflecting on the back of what he said in, towards the beginning of the interview about, um, you know, working together, Edison and so on, these kind of great minds over the years that they've, they, they don't work in isolation. And I started to think about how, you know, hundreds of years ago where these, these great minds would exchange letters. And I think Edison was exactly that. There was two of them, wasn't there, were inventing light bulbs. And they were, they were exchanging letters and talking about these ideas. They, they were allowing, oh, there was that exchange of, dialogue communication minds swapping things and you know we've we've always done that in innovation i guess whether it's you know whether it's not formal or not kind of part of a process it's that that need as a human to to for your brain to go beyond your own skull and and connect with something else and the things that we always regard as the greatest inventions are the inventions that allow us to communicate even more Yes, bingo. For me, technology and humanity, if they always are linked together. And we need to always keep that link and never allow it to break. I don't think there's a better way to end this interview. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. Thank you very much. I think I was really moved towards the end here when, when uh, Anna was talking about touch and and for me, it's just there's there's so many aspects of being human that we pay so little attention to when we're working with digital products. And just having that closeness uh, is so important. And we are working with digital tools that are supposed to affect people across the world sometimes or across a huge distance and across time as well, because people use the things that we build long afterwards we've built them. So having that connection to the people you're building with, it's so important to have that ahead of time because that's how you know and learn about the things that you need to be paying attention to when you're designing. I also took it though, the whole kind of, because I mentioned about exchanging letters, you know, the, the great minds of the past and that, that need to be more than one brain, yes, um, which we've well, talked yeah. about, you know, about pair designing and pair programming, all this kind of stuff. Mm. But, um, you know, I'm always pair designing. Yeah, well, you are. It's difficult to avoid, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, the, the double pair, mm -hmm. and the, um, but no, the, the double diamond thing that you, you're effectively you've got your personal double diamond the whole time. But at least I I like to do that. The, you ne I need time when I'm working by myself so I can I can I can get flow. I can get focus depending on the task. But you need that. But then I also need time to to share that with someone else and and probably get some kind of like. You know, feedback or acknowledgement that yes it's a good idea no this is not really right james and then so you, you go in and out in, in your own little double diamond flow constantly but you also need that feedback and that conversation with someone mm. who doesn't feel inferior to you so there does there can't be a power imbalance because the risk always there is then that they will actually sort of praise you because of who you are rather than what you've actually showed them yes you need the you need mm. the, the trust um and, and openness um mm to be able to make that work um but it's but it's important because if not you you went you risk being isolated yeah um and i think an isolated designer is never going to be um a, a truly useful designer i mean no it, it, it's dangerous it sounds like a dangerous concept and, and dangerous not only for i mean the effect of what you're building but also for the person who is alone yeah and uh, doesn't this tie in a I see to it. There was a slide in um, Anna's talk, which we didn't talk about really in the interview, um, which you were talking about self-reflection and mm. used the um, example of the, you know, the, the back of the seat um, instructions you have on airplanes where it tells you that you need to, um, you need to secure your own mask before helping others with, with their mask. Mm. Um, and that, that applying that to designers that um, um, you've got to you know, reflect on yourself, you know, like your own past, um, your own present, where you are now, and also where you want to be in the future. 
Um, exactly. And, and the message being, I mean, you, you can't help anyone else if you are not well yourself. Mm. And that ties in. With why do we get things wrong? Because we are stressed or there is peer pressure uh, or, or hierarchy. Our, health, our health is bad. Yeah, hierarchy. There are so many reasons Nothing. to get things wrong. Mm. But if we're not thinking ahead of time about these are my values, this is how I think, this is how I want to work. These are my experiences. This, this, these, this is my ethics, set of ethics. These are my values. If I don't think about that ahead of time and I divert from them, even though I'm not noticing, then after some time, I'm going to realize I'm not working according to who I myself am. And I, that, I think, is extremely dangerous for the results, but for you as a person. Yeah. And you won't believe if you aren't aligned, you, you can't do good stuff. Exactly. So thank you very much for listening today. And um, if you aren't already following us, subscribing to us or whatever you need to do in whatever podcast client you are listening to us on, then just press a button. There's bound to be a button somewhere close by you can press. <laughs> press more buttons. It's been a while since I've said that one. Um, and, and what recommended listening have you found for recommended us? Recommended listening. Um, and I'll put links to these episodes in the show notes, which you will find in the podcast client. If not, you'll find it on uxpodcast.com. Um, but I recommend you go along and visit the design thinking tag on our website, because that will allow you to see all the episodes that we've tagged up as design thinking over the years. Um, so not only is there this episode, there's the last episode, episode 309. Um, there's an um, interview we did in 2019 with um, Jean Litka, um, which was about design thinking, which we call the, the, the business value of design, episode mm. 224. Then we've also got the classic two-part interview with Don Norman, Don Norman which was design doing, um, which is nice because we get the talking about the journey that we've been through, that you get the progression, progression from um, design thinking to design doing um, and then to you know, people and society and all these kind of uh, thoughts that we've evolved during the year. And then just fuck it all. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and there's a couple more episodes as well there that we've, uh, we've tagged up as design thinking, um, which knowing us means that they're not explicitly about design thinking, but they will have some link and something thought-provoking for you. Not threatening, but provoking. Awesome. Remember to keep moving. See you on the other side. I actually think this is probably one of the worst ones we've ever had. Okay. okay. Yeah. Excellent. Where do sharks go on holiday? I don't know, James. Where do sharks go on holiday? Finland. Ooh. <laughs> and, and I've, I've actually got another one that's probably as bad, right? Okay. Where do bees go on holiday? I don't know, James. Where do bees go on holiday? Stingapore. <laughs> <laughs> That's not even a place. <laughs>